So, the, let's start. I uh, welcome everybody to our Monday seminar. It's uh, it's really weird this year, but doing all of, doing it all on Zoom. Uh, today we have uh, Shin Yu Wu from uh, CMU to tell us explicit near fully X Ramanujan graphs. Go. And uh, yeah, one thing. Uh, Shin Yu would love to talk more with any of you about this material later. Uh, or, yeah, so uh, besides the talk, she's really interested. So uh, let's start. All right. So yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Like, thanks for thanks for having me here at your seminar. Uh, so I'll tell you about this paper. It's uh, joint work with Brian O'Donnell at CMU. And uh, so yeah, let me just start by showing you a picture of my favorite graph. So this is a, a six regular infinite tree. And uh, yeah, I usually like notate this as T6. And here are some like even more interesting pictures of graphs that will be covered in the setting of this talk. And in general, I'll be like talking about some uh, infinite graphs with some sort of repeating pattern. So like the main, the main theme of this work is that um, I'm trying to find finite graphs that will resemble the graphical structure and the spectrum of all of these like infinite graphs in some way. So yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, construct like finite graphs that will resemble the infinite graphs in these like two different measures of similarity at the same time. Okay, so yeah, but like, so like just for the beginning of the talk, I'm just going to give you like a very broad overview of what's going on in this goal. And um, I'm just going to talk very informally about some ideas and results. And like by the end of the talk, I'll like have defined everything formally for you. So yeah, the question of like whether we can find finite graphs which resemble the spectrum and the structure of an infinite graph, that's like a pretty natural question to ask. We do know a classical situation where this goal can be achieved. So it's already been accomplished by like finite Ramanujan graphs, uh, where like a Ramanujan graph is just like a graph that has a non-trivial, like it's non-trivial eigenvalues with magnitude at most two square root d minus one. And so, yeah, I think I'm still pronouncing it wrongly, but uh, Ramanujan graphs, they, they look like infinite deregular graphs because like their local neighborhoods resemble the local neighborhoods of a deregular tree. And then they also have this spectral property that make them look like the infinite deregular tree. So yeah, the spectral radius of the infinite deregular tree, it's also two square root D minus one. So that's where this uh, connection is going to come in. And yeah, so like this like paper is going to generically be about expanders and like expanders have, I guess they have many applications in theoretical computer science that I won't be going into in this talk. I'll just be talking about them in the abstract. Okay, so there are like many constructions of Ramanujan graphs, but uh, for this talk, I'll just, I'll be going with like a slightly different angle, which is to try and find like random constructions. So it turns out that if we are looking at deregular graphs, a uh, random deregular graph uh, is actually going to also uh, have this property of uh, approximating the infinite deregular tree. So like, for example, this like, Oh, so yeah, by a random deregular graph, I just mean you can uh, sum up, say, the random matchings, and then you can, that's how you get a random deregular graph. And it actually is going to have this property of like approximating the infinite deregular tree by this uh, conjecture of Alon, and that was proven by Friedman, which says that a, a random deregular graph is going to be almost Ramanujan. Uh, so yeah, okay, so this is like a classical situation of uh, deregular graphs. And then like the natural like next question to ask is, can we generalize this to something beyond just like regular graphs? Uh, so Friedman also conjectured that if you do a random lift of a base graph, then this graph, it will like resemble the universal covering tree of a random, of, of the base graph. And it also like approximates the spectrum of the universal covering tree in the sense that the non-trivial spectral radius is less than the spectral radius of the universal covering tree. So uh, yeah. Just a second, I have just to make sure that everybody knows what lifts are. Or what yeah, yeah, so I will, I'm, I'm going to go, there, go through all of that in the next like, slide. I'm just uh, saying the statement. 
yeah, and this was like proven by proven by Bonov and Collins in a very recent paper. And in fact, they they prove like uh, they prove like much more than this. And uh, what our paper is going to do is like as an explicit form of the theorem of Bonov and Collins. Okay, so uh, yeah, like. Um, if you didn't, yeah, so I, I'm now going to tell you about uh, lifts and universal covering trees. So a lift is when uh, you have some base graph. So in this case, I've had this like five vertex graph. It's a like two, three biregular, uh, complete biregular graph. And then, uh, and then for each like vertex in my original graph, I will like replace the vertex with like n vertices. In this case, n is three. And uh, then for each like edge in the original graph, I'm going to replace that with a uh, matching. So uh, I there was like this like gray edge. I'm going to replace that with a gray matching and the brown edge and like so on. So now I just get like a graph with three n vertices and uh, three times the number of edges as well. And this like operation is called uh, doing a n lift. And it, of course, it depends on what matchings you choose to use. Okay, so uh, here are some like properties. So in the, okay, in the sense that I'll properly define later, uh, n lift is, all the n lifts will like sort of locally resemble each other and they also locally resemble the original base graph. And then there's like going to be this limiting object called the universal covering tree, which is like the infinity lift, or it's like the, the like infinite tree, which all of the, uh, finite lifts will like kind of locally resemble. And then, yeah, so if just like for like technically this is the limit is in this like local limit of benjamini schramm limit sense. Um, and, and like as an example, if I take this two tree bipartite graph and I look, I, I, I take like the infinity lift and that is going to be like the infinite uh, two tree biregular uh, tree. Sorry, can you tell us what you mean by the limit in the sense of Benjamin? Uh, it's so yeah, that's like it's just uh says that like I think for all constant size neighborhoods, the finite graph is going to be like isomorphic to a portion of the infinite graph, and uh, that happens like with high probability or something. Yeah, so I, I think it's. Yeah, like, I guess I, I'm just going to appeal to like your intuition here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and not go into like the technical right. details here too much. Is that, uh, one, is that one right? point uh, yeah. in the Benjamini Shram, and you said it, but I think uh, just to make it clear is that for most points, it looks like the uh, covering, not for all, and that's, a, that's why the notion is very useful. So it's for most points, uh, probabilistically. Yeah. Right. Because the notion of convergence of metric space and so on is uh, quite standard in the graphs, but this, the key word there is almost for most points. Yeah. yeah, so it's like you sample uniformly from the finite graph and then you look like, a, you look at the constant size neighborhood of it and then with high probability that looks like a piece of the infinite graph, basically, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, so a random n lift is just uh, if I take all of these uh, matchings and I choose them uh, uniformly at random. Yeah, so, okay. So going back to this, then like Friedman's conjecture says that if you do one of these random lifts, if you, if you start with some base graph and then you, uh, if you have this universal covering tree, that's like a deterministic object. And then if you do like large, larger and larger end lifts, the end lifts are going to um, approximate the spectrum of the universal covering tree. Yeah, so, right. So yeah, so okay, this theorem was proven by Bonov Collins in their paper. And uh, actually they proved like a much more general statement that I'm going to end up going through, I'm gonna go through like in the rest of the talk and also talk about how to make their construction like de-randomized. Okay, so I guess the direction that I want to think about now is just like uh, going, so if I have a 
graph that's not a tree, how can I do this sort of like approximation, uh, this sort of like approximation with a finite graph notion? So if I want to, sorry? When I make a comment. Yeah. yeah, that's a, I, I think that in the context of constructing expanders and even dreaming of constructing uh, Ramanujan graphs, the idea of lifts and random lifts uh, originates from uh, the paper of Bilo and Lineal. And uh, when uh, uh, Marcus Spielmann Srivastava, you know, put the conjecture, this was the first alternative to the number theoretic co uh, constructions. Of Ramanujan graphs. So I just wanted to mention but, this piece but, of. But, uh, Avi, uh, just uh, you should, I mean, I know you know that, but in the way you said it, it sounds like the, 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 that they have a construction. It's not a construction, it's an interesting existent theorem which is no. neither random nor constructive. No, they have a construction also. It's weaker bound. It's like a square root d log d. But they, uh, can no, no, no. I'm talking about the, the no, not, not, not about the, the talk today. I'm talking about the no, Spillman. Even Bilu Lineal had the construction, but not exactly Ramanujan. Ah, ah not, not Ramanujan. Right. Yes, and also uh, Spillman uh, and friends had several papers. I think it's, uh, uh, and maybe it's uh, one of Cohen was a student at MIT. Uh, there, is, there are explicit deterministic constructions also. Oh, oh really? Yes. Oh, this I don't know, because in the original Spielman, no, they no, don't no. have. No, but... Oh. Uh, yeah. What's the, the name? Cohen. What's the name? Who is the guy? What's the name? Cohen, uh, Michael Cohen. He actually died. Uh, what? I, I'm always sure it is him. Anyway, uh, yeah, the method of uh, interlacing polynomial uh, just give existence, but they had several constructions and one of them can be made efficient. Mm -hmm. Good. Can I take this back? Can you go back one slide? <laughs> Thanks. <Okay. laughs> uh, yeah. In this theorem at the bottom there, where you say the random as the, the spectrum, is this, why are you only talking about the spectral radius or are you talking about the entire spectrum, meaning that with high probability this Binyamini Shram converges to the universal cover of the object. So that means that potentially the spectrum would have all the other gaps that the universal Yeah, yeah. So that's uh that's uh, there is a thing that I will I will get into in the, in like three slides. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so um right. So I guess let me just like motivate things a bit more by saying that um we want to, so, okay, well, uh, like now we can, okay, so potentially we can, we might want to find like finite graphs that sort of resemble uh, infinite trees, but like we can also like go further than this and say that maybe we want to find finite graphs that resemble more like complicated infinite graphs, like this graph that I drew, which is like the uh, free product of a uh, triangle and like a uh, four clique, where if you, you just have like, you, you have like a clique and then each at each and each uh, vertex there's a triangle stuck onto it and then there's like a clique stuck onto each vertex of the triangle and it just goes on forever then i might want to find a finite graph that sort of locally looks like this and it also uh resembles like the spectrum of this graph and um one way to sort of interpret this is just like i want to find a expander that has some sort of local constraint like i want to the expander to uh, like its local uh, pieces should look like this infinite graph. And um, yeah, like, so these kinds of graphs do come up in like computer science, for example, as like typical instances of constraint satisfaction problems Like you can interpret uh, these kinds of graphs as kind of a constraint graph of a set of a random set instance. And then if you look at the spectrum of these graphs, it tells you some things about whether the instance is going to be like refutable. And um, okay, so I'm still like talking at a very like high level and informally, but um, let me just sort of uh, slightly wave my hands at what the notion of spectral approximation that I eventually want is. So informally, I sort of want all of the non-trivial eigenvalues of the finite graphs to be like exactly where they're supposed to be, which is a stronger notion than just asking for uh, the 
spectral radius to be bounded by like the correct amount. And uh, like as a, in, in just like as a picture form, if I have this, uh, this like graph that I was looking at earlier, the support of the spectrum looks something like uh, it has like two atoms and it has two intervals. So um, I'm plotting this as a like one dimensional set. It's just the support of the spectrum and not like the spectral measure of function. But, uh, and then what I want to do is that I want to find a finite graph that, well, it like locally should look like this infinite graph and the non-trivial spectrum of the finite graph should also look like the non-trivial spectrum of the infinite graph. So it should like match all of the gaps and you should like fill out all the intervals. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I should say that like here the, um, I drew these as like sort of evenly spaced, but they are, they are not necessarily, they just like, they're just going to fill out the intervals in some way. Uh, like for example, in every like epsilon interval, there's at least one eigenvalue. And again, I'll, I'll like go into all of this formally later, but first I kind of want to, I first want to go get into an idea of in the, that came up in the bottom of Colin's paper that um, I think is like very cool and it lets us kind of uh, do all of these, uh, it, it lets us get all of these like approximation of graphs. So I guess, yeah, the first thing, uh, the first thing that we need to do to um, approximate, to like find finite like approximations of infinite graphs is just like, how do we even like represent the infinite graph in like a succinct way? And um, the goal now is like, I want to come up with some sort of uh, algebraic recipe that can describe these infinite graphs. So this idea is this like kind of algebraic representation is from the Born of Collins paper. But um, if you, I guess if you read that paper, it's not, it may not be uh, quite so clear that this is what they are talking about. And like our contribution in our paper is to investigate like exactly which graphs their framework kind of covers. So I'll step through this idea with just like a couple of examples, starting with again the uh, six regular infinite tree here. Okay, so um, yeah, there are a few different ways to look at this six regular infinite tree. Um, like the one that I want to use is to uh, view it as this like algebraic notion of like the Cayley graph of the free group on tree generators, or it's uh, just Z free product with itself three times. So uh, I guess a quick way to see this is that the like vertices in the graph are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the words of the free group and the edges are described by the generators. So uh, yeah, let me color the edges so that you can see which edges correspond to which generators. And uh, yeah, so that I've made them directed so that they correspond to the forward generator and uh, when you're also supposed to add the backward generator so that, the, I mean the inverse generator so that you get an, like you get a undirected graph at the end. So like, yeah, each generator can be, and uh, right. So if I start at any vertex and for example, I follow like the green arrow that defines a graph isomorphism. So each generator sort of corresponds to a infinite permutation on the vertices. And um, like, I guess more, Formally, the precise notion in which the the uh, six regular tree is supposed to be the sum of tree generators and their inverses is that if I take each generator, I can uh, get a matrix representation of the generator. And then, uh, yeah, so like P G one is supposed to be like the left regular representation of G one, and and so on. And then if I add up all of these uh, generators and their inverses, I will get the adjacency matrix of the graph. Um, and uh, continue. Is each color just like a two regular infinite two regular graph? Is it what, what is the structure here? Is it is, is it an infinite number of disjoint paths of like infinite path length um, two or? Yeah, it's a it should be an infinite number of disjoint paths. Right. So yeah, because and then like I so I have to add the permutation matrices and then I also add their adjoints because the adjoints is the same as the permutation matrix of the inverse generator. And then, um, yeah, and then now I'm just going to do this like very, this like abstraction where instead of looking at this sum as just a sum, I'm going to um, express it as a formal polynomial. So this polynomial is just going to take in three terms and then it's just like 
the sum of x1, x2, x3, plus the adjoints of x1, x2, and x3. And um, then the, the adjacency matrix is just like P applied to the permutation matrices. And like, I guess for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to like uh, identify the permutation matrices of the generators with the generators themselves and just like write P of G1, G2, and G3. So, um, and yeah, I guess one remark that I have is that like, because I'm adding in the inverse permutation, the inverse term of every term in the polynomial, that's going to give me an undirected graph. And I basically only want to think about undirected graphs in this talk. So whenever I have a polynomial, I'm going to require that it's like formally self adjoint in the sense that for every term that appears, the, the adjoint of the term also appears in the polynomial. And yeah, okay, so I guess the, the reason why I'm, I went through this trouble of trying to like take the sum and express it as a polynomial is that now we can uh, consider like more complicated poly polynomials. Like we can just write down this polynomial x1 plus x2 plus x1, x2 plus the adjoints. And then I can ask, so what is this like, what is the graph that's described by the polynomial of the polynomial Q applied to two uh, free generators? So, well, okay, it's not, I guess it's not immediately obvious what the graph you're gonna get is. And um, I don't actually know a good way to say what point, like given a graph, what polynomial should I use? Or like given a polynomial, what graph do I get? Other than just like trying to draw it out with a piece of paper. But like, I'll just make like a couple of uh, observations, which is that, well, because I have two variables, then uh, I have two variables and I plug in two like free generators, then the vertices of the graph are supposed to be the elements of the uh, free group on two generators, or it's like Z free product with itself. And uh, because I have three terms uh, and I'm plugging in like one uh, generator and it's inverse for each of the terms, I'm going to get a six regular graph. So, okay, so after you like, try to draw the picture, you realize that it's supposed to be this graph, which is like, it has three triangles, uh, where there are three triangles like stuck at each point of the graph. And uh, to see this, I guess I'm, I have like colored the edges of the graph according to the terms. So basically X1 and X2 give you like a four regular tree. And then uh, the X1, X2 terms say something like, whenever you take a step along an X1 term and then an X2 term, you should uh, join the, you should join the two vertices that you started and ended at. Okay, so uh, like I guess one other like minor technical point is that, um, well, if I only ever plug in the, uh, my, if I, if I only ever plug in the uh, polynomials of like permutations and their inverses, then I'll only get like even degree graphs because like one permutation plus its inverse is like a degree, it's like a degree two graph. And when I add them up, it get even degrees. But uh, like in this like framework, you can basically, you can also like somehow force some of these, uh, you can enforce that some of these variables are supposed to take in matchings and not just permutations. So like self inverse generators. And, uh, but like, again, I'm not going to go into detail about this in this talk and I will just like for the rest of the talk, pretend that everything is supposed to be just uh, uh, like a free generator or permutation. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is there any relationship between uh, this polynomial representation of the graph? Obviously you get a Cayley graph. Uh, and uh, just the presentation, the relations in the presentation of that group. So first, I, I haven't been able to find any connection, at least like, yeah, like I've tried, but it does not seem to me that I can just look at the presentation of the graph and tell you what the polynomial is. Okay. okay. So I guess now um, we sort of have a way to identify formal polynomials with uh, infinite graphs. So, um, well, okay, I guess like one potential problem is that like we only, so far we've only seen how to make regular graphs because, uh, the, like, because of uh, these like unweighted polynomials that we have. So one direction we might try to go is to, uh, well, we have like a polynomial, then 
can we just like algebraically generalize these polynomials to try and see what other graphs we can get? So one natural thing to do is to just like add coefficients to the polynomial. So for example, if like we added just like some scalar coefficients and uh, say if the coefficients happen to add up to one, then uh, the interpretation of this, of this is that uh, I might have this, I have this uh, tree and then I'm going to, uh, instead of like, I, I'm going to do a weighted random walk on the tree. And uh, we might also desire to find like finite graphs that um, it, it also like approximates the spectrum of the uh, infinite tree in this, like the infinite random walk, weighted random walk in this way. So uh, I can find a weighted deregular graph that uh, whose like spectrum is similar to like this, like this like infinite, uh, I guess you can think of it as like a Markov chain now. Um, so, okay, so that's like one uh, small generalization we can do, but like a bigger, a bigger generalization and like one much more interesting uh, that I guess uh, Bernard Collins used in their paper to like, uh, so that they can describe lifts um, is to, instead of having, instead of having like just scalar weights, we now have matrix weights. And uh, yeah, so let me just talk about what a matrix weighted graph is, is all about. So uh, basically, I can, I can say I, I have this like four cycle. And then instead of having like scalar weights on the edges, I'm going to put in a matrix weight. So uh, I guess in this work, I will, I will like require that my matrix, my matrices are all like square. And uh, I'll also focus on the case where my matrices are zero one valued. So in this case, I have these, okay, so I guess now I can think about what is the adjacency matrix of this graph supposed to be? So I have the, I guess I have the adjacency matrix of a normal like four cycle. And then uh, instead of, and then instead of putting just like zeros and ones into the adjacency matrix, whenever there's supposed to be a non-zero element that corresponds to an edge, I can put it, I just like put in the matrix weights. So like I start with a four by four adjacency matrix and then I put in like the two by two weights. And so I get like a eight by eight matrix. And then because my matrix, my adjacency matrix is now like uh, zero one, has like zero one values, I can sort of reinterpret this graph as, a, as like a scalar graph. So each of the original like blue vertices that I had here, I, um, I, I split them up into like two different vertices like that kind of uh, belong to a cloud. And then each matrix weight in the matrix weighted graph, it corresponds to like a matching across the clouds. Yeah, so that's, I guess, this is how I would think about uh, matrix weighted graphs. Just, uh, and there's always this thing where uh, if I have this matrix weighted graph and then I look at its adjacency matrix, I can also reinterpret the matrix weighted graph as, uh, as just like a scalar graph. Okay, so I guess this, this kind of, uh, this machinery is what's going to let us like generalize lifts. So uh, let me look again at uh, this, like this graph that we had earlier that where I talked, when I talked about lifts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the edges of the, okay, I'm going to create a matrix weighted graph that has one vertex. And then uh, how it, how, how, what I'm going to do is like, so for each of the edges in the original graph, I'm going to put like a self loop on the one vertex and uh, the, the weight of the loop is like the, the adjacency matrix of that edge. So for example, I have this like edge that goes from one to two. So I should create like another a self loop here that uh, has a one in the one to two. And um, I'm also like splitting up each edge into a forward edge and a backward edge. So like I only drew like half the edges here that are actually supposed to be like 12 edges, but uh, they are like half of them are adjoined to the other half. Okay, so yeah, this is like a really weird construction, but like you would notice that if you try to uh, interpret the adjacency matrices of these two graphs, they are actually have the same adjacency matrix. Okay, so for each of the, for each of the, um, yeah, so I'm going to take each edge like adjacency matrix and then I'm going to call it like a matrix weight of a matrix polynomial. 
And the matrix polynomial that I will be looking at is this polynomial. It's this, like, it's just the linear polynomial with uh, matrix weights equal to like the weights of the, the, with the, the weight, the self loop weights of the graph. So I have this, I had like six uh, loops just now and the adjoints, and I'm just going to put, use the, those as my weights. And then when I plug in uh, polynomials into this, this matrix coefficient, like polynomial, this, this, when I plug in the, sorry, when I plug in permutations into this polynomial, um, what I should, how I should evaluate it is that I take the matrix coefficient and like tensor product that with the polynomial. And then I add all of these things up. And just like, as a quick example, if I plug in just once, I get back the, uh, this like weird uh, self loop graph and uh, it has the same like adjacency matrix. But uh, if I plug in bigger polynomials, then uh, I mean bigger permutations, then I'm going to get a, actually going to get a lift of the original graph. So I guess like, yeah, it's not like super simple to see how exactly the correspondence here is like equal to the, the, the usual definition of lifts, but it's like kind of basically, well, I, I am going to tensor each edge with a permutation. And then like in the usual lift, I have each edge, but with a, with a, a matching, but you can also like sort of define a matching as a permutation from like one, one of the sides to itself. And that's like the correct permutation matrix that I should plug in here. And somehow, yeah, so I guess this is going to uh, give me a lift of the base graph. And then if I plug in the free generators, I'm going to get the universal covering tree. Uh, yeah, so this is the, yeah, so this is like how you can use this, these, this matrix polynomials to, uh, to like generalize lifts. And this is indeed what uh, Born of Collins did to, uh, to prove the generalized uh, Freeman's theorem. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess like at this point, like the, I guess the natural question is really like what other graphs can you get with these matrix polynomials? Um, and like, this is what something that uh, we do in our paper. And uh, I guess I also won't uh, go too much, go into like detail about how exactly these constructions work, but uh, we will show that like they include the they include the free products of any like finite vertex transitive graphs or like finite Cayley graphs. And they also include like a lot of other uh, products that people have studied in the literature, including uh, these additive products in this paper by Mohanty and O'Donnell. And then these uh, amalgamated free products in a recent paper by Vargas and Kokani. And, uh, so there are these like sort of graph products, but like the matrix polynomials actually can uh, get even like more graphs. For example, it can get some funny graphs like SL2Z, or it can get this uh, weird hexagon graph that I had on the cover slide of this 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 talk. Um, yeah, and these are those are like not easily described by uh, graph products. So oh yeah, and here's some here's some pictures of of, of infinite graphs that are included. And yeah, so many of these graphs have like, I can have cycles in them. They're not regular. They don't, uh, they don't even like, they, they might not even be Cayley graphs. Um, okay, so I guess we also, other than like looking at what graphs we can produce, we also uh, look at, we also try to uh, characterize some graphs that are not uh, included in like matrix polynomials. So for example, uh, we show that the matrix polynomial graphs all need to have like finite tree width and they need to be hyperbolic. And so in particular grids are not describable by these matrix polynomials. And also uh, they, we show that they need to be like unimodular, which sort of means that, uh, it basically sort of means that if you like pretend that you are standing at any one vertex in the infinite infinite graph and then you like spin around you cannot tell like which direction is which 
And uh, yeah, so I guess one canonical example of a non-unimodular graph is this uh, grandparent graph where you sort of uh, pick a direction and then you connect every vertex to its parent and its grandparents. And may I ask you, uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, in all the examples which are included in the theory, I think that the fundamental group, the group acting is virtually free. Not necessarily a free group, but as a several finite index of a free group. Now, on the other hand, as, as a necessary condition, you say that it should be hyperbolic. But do you really, what about groups which are hyperbolic but not virtually free? Like the, the, the first example to think about is a surface group. Can you have, can your method work on examples such that uh, the acting group is a surface group rather than a virtually free group? So I think a surface group doesn't have finite tree width. They, does not have what? Finite tree width. Uh, finite, what is finite tree width? What does it mean? Uh, that's, uh, the, that's like this, uh, you can do this like decomposition where you can uh, group the vertices into, into like, okay, I, I don't, sorry, I don't know a quick way to explain it. Oh, yeah. maybe, the, oh, I see. Uh, if, maybe, I'm, maybe this exactly means that the, that the acting group is virtually free. Okay. Maybe uh, that's... This is connected. When you answer the question, you'll compute the spectral measure algebraically, right? you actually will know what those intervals that you wrote down are in all your examples. So there's a conjecture that the only graphs for which the spectrum, these infinite graphs, the spectrum is, uh, uh, these intervals are sort of algebraic. I think it's by Boos, W-O-E-S-S, -S, is, is virtually free. And it's a theorem actually of Noam Chomsky. <laughs> That if you're virtually free, this is something in languages, then the, you can compute these uh, return, these polynomials. I mean, you'll get to it, I'm sure, and then I'll make a comment. But I think you are restricted to virtually free. I agree with Alex. Okay. That is to say, all your all your groups, if it's coming from a group, have a finite index subgroup which is free. I in see. That case, Keston's method works to compute these things. Yeah, I don't think I'm actually going to get into the uh, polynomial and uh, the computing the spectrum stuff. So. But in principle, you can in, in yeah. finite terms, right? Yeah. It's set up so that you, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the infinite object. You will know that the spectrum, say, of the nearest or any one of these uh, decorated operators, the spectrum consists of bands and gaps which are explicit. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a paper of Lena that computes these spectra? Of who? Uh, Lena, I think. Oh, uh, right. So, but those are for these virtually free, as Alex says. I, I mean, I think it's. No, good. Th those are exactly for these, uh, like these kinds of matrix weighted operators. Yeah, I think that, yeah, so for these, I think it goes back to, as I said, Chomsky. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So let me move on to uh, talking about what, uh, right. So, okay, let me now, uh, so, okay, let me now move on to just like talking about what really I mean by uh, resembling the spectrum and the structure of these uh, infinite graphs. So, uh, yeah, like I guess we want, basically we want to be able to, for all of these like polynomials uh, of like permutations, be able to find finite graphs that uh, match the infinite graphs. And uh, right, so let me talk about this like uh, graph structure stuff. So I guess, well, it, well, I guess the, the, the infinite object is gonna be described by like a matrix uh, polynomial of uh, kind of infinite permutations. So kind of the natural like idea is just 
uh, let me like sort of subsample these infinite permutations with finite permutations and replace the, the replace the permutation matrices with like finite permutation matrices. And uh, I guess in particular for all of these like random constructions, I'm just going to use a random uh, permutation. So for example, for this uh, polynomial on like x1 plus x2 plus x3, then if I plug in random permutations, I'm just going to get a random six regular graph on n vertices. And then for this like other example that I had of uh, this x1 plus x2 plus x1 x2 thing, then if I plug in random two random permutations this time to each of x1 and x2, then I get, I get some graph that looks like this. And uh, the key thing to notice here is just like, if I compare it with like the infinite graph, like actually it has this like similar like local structure where uh, this each of these, uh, th this like triangle structure kind of appears in the finite graph. And uh, I guess you might like object and say that, well, some of these vertices don't actually look like they have three triangles stuck to them. But like, I guess uh, the thing to do is to say that uh, I want to like define my notion of uh, resembling in such a way that all of these uh, like kind of local blemishes are like allowed. And I guess uh, in, in particular, because of this uh, like benjamin stram convergence stuff, it means that like with high probability, if you uh, with high probability among the vertices, uh, you will you will have like fewer and fewer uh, portions that don't look like pieces of the infinite graph as as you take n to infinity. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, this like notion that I'm using is that of a uh, covering, which says that if I have, I, I would say that like a uh, graph G covers a like, graph H. If there's like a surjection from G to H, there's also a local bijection, and this local bijection is like supposed to take into account the weights. So uh, the way that like this happens is just, well, okay, so if I kind of uh, look at the matrix weights level of the graph, it's like a deregular infinite tree with like uh, matrix weights, weighted graphs, and then my local bijection should kind of match the uh, which weights, uh, which weights are at which vertices. So yeah, like, I guess, um, I will also like not write down the proper full definition of covering because that uh, takes a while and just like sort of appeal to your intuition here. But like there's some examples of what, how this uh, definition is supposed to work is that like any n lift of a base graph, it's supposed to uh, cover the base graph. And then the universal covering tree, uh, well, it's called the universal covering tree because it covers the base graph and it also covers any n lift. And then for any of these like matrix polynomials, uh, if I plug in the, if the infinite object, it will cover any of the finite objects where I plug in a finite permutation instead of the infinite generator. Yeah, so yeah, so this is the sense in which I say that uh, my finite objects are going to locally resemble the infinite object of the polynomials. Uh, any questions? To be clear, uh, do you talk about L2 of the infinite? Do you think of the Hilbert space of square summable uh, yes. functions there in your spectrum? Do you talk about when, or do you just uh, discuss these uh, sort of moment calculations which are with your P's? Oh, this is that on the panel, Peter. You know it very well. You gave the proof. No, no, no. I'm asking, sometimes you don't, uh, I'm just, Curious if you actually go to the universal cover and and discuss. I mean, you could look. Do you talk about the Hilbert space structure on the universal cover? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I or at least I, I guess I don't formally talk about it in the talk, but I will. Oh. I think of the. I think of all of these adjacency operators as acting on the Hilbert space. Okay, it's just that. Uh, if you're amenable or not amenable, you're gr and th this is a fundamental difference in this discussion. So I'm just no, curious. It's really a, a virtually free group discussion here, Peter. I mean, uh, it's she uh, takes uh, the universal uh, tree and just taken uh, the operator is not the the one which is the different. It's well, maybe uh, yeah. we'll let, see. Let, let, her, let her talk. Something the, the spectrum and uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll, I'm gonna talk about spectrum stuff like momentarily. So 
maybe if, if, if you, you have any more questions about spectrum, um, we can talk about that like right after these, like, this section. Okay, so yeah, I guess like, okay, so that was like for what it means to like structurally like resemble the infinite graph. And then I guess there was the other thing that I want, which is like, I want my finite graphs to also look like the infinite graphs like spectrum. So um, yeah, like how I'm going to, yeah, I'm gonna like define this like closeness and spectrum in like a very, uh, it's a, like gonna be like a very strong requirement. So I want, basically I want to have a, to find like a sequence of finite permutations so that the spectrum of the finite permutation, uh, the polynomial applied to the finite permutation is like approaches the uh, spectrum of the polynomial applied to the infinite generators. So I guess just to remind you, the spectrum is supposed to be the set where uh, the the set where uh, this uh, sorry this lambda i minus the adjacency matrix is not invertible. Okay, so uh, I guess this like example that I was looking at, which is the infinite uh, six regular tree, uh, the spectrum of the infinite graph is ju just this interval from minus two root five to two root five. And again, I'm just like drawing this picture of the support of the spectrum as a set. And then uh, I want to find the, I want to find a random finite, say six regular graph where the uh, points, in, so the points in the spectrum, the, there's going to be this one uh, point at six. And then other than that, there's uh, going to be, like I want them to like fill up this entire interval from two, minus two root five to two root five, which is like the, in, the interval of the uh, spectrum of the infinite tree. And uh, yeah, I guess, again, this is not like, this is just like a cartoon and they're not actually supposed to be, in, to be like evenly spaced. I guess you'll actually have them co congregate in like a way that's like according to the spectral measure of the infinite tree. Okay, so I guess, uh, let me just like quickly take care of this uh, eigenvalue at six, which uh, it's like, which is like, I guess we kind of want to, define our notion of convergence in such a way that we ignore exactly this this uh this eigenvalue because it's like it's going to be the trivial eigenvalue in the sense that well it's the eigenvalue of the all ones factor which is uh also like it's just going to be present in every six regular graph so i guess in that sense we can want to sort of ignore it and uh because i'm like the infinite operators i'm thinking of them as acting on the l2 space so it's like uh, the all ones vector is not an, a vector there, and uh, it's not supposed to be an eigenvector of the infinite graph. And so, like in this way, I can I want to, yeah, just say that I, uh, I I discard like the all ones vector for the finite graphs. And uh, how do I like find these? Well, they're just the eigenvalues of the polynomial applied to all ones. So in the case where it's an unweighted polynomial, this would just be the degree of the graph. And when it's a matrix polynomial, then uh, when I plug in the all ones, I should get some sort of like base graph uh, on whatever the dimension of the matrices are. And uh, the trivial eigenvalues are just the eigenvalues of the base graph of the matrix polynomial. Okay, and then uh, the, yeah, so the, here's the notion of like closeness and spectrum that I'm actually using. So it's like, I want to say that for every n large enough, I want to say that the, uh, for every point in the non-trivial spectrum of the finite graph, it should be like within epsilon of a point in the infinite spectrum and uh, vice versa. So this kind of, uh, it's like a really strong uh, notion to ask for because it says that like, I should have like no outlier eigenvalues at all outside of like the spectrum of the infinite graph. So for example, it's like stronger than asking for just convergence in the empirical spectral distribution because that allows you to have like little o of one outlier eigenvalues. It just says that the, the fraction of eigenvalues in, are supposed to converge to the, uh, the infinite graphs fraction. But I am saying that like, I want the, the, the support of the spe spectrum to converge. And also, uh, if my infinite graph, for example, it's the two tree biregular tree and it has like two different uh, intervals, then my uh, finite graph should like match those two intervals exactly. And it should also like match the gap in between the two intervals. Okay, so, 
Um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm, I'm talking about this in terms of the sets of the spectrum. And if you're worried about like the convergence and the spectral measures, uh, the way that like this theorem gets proved, for example, in uh, Bonner of Collins, it also ends up in implying like the convergence of the spectral measures. Okay, so that's like what I exactly meant by these uh, closeness and the spectrum and the, spe the structure. And now, like, let me just uh, state what uh, all of these uh, Raman Newton graphs and uh, Friedman's theorem, what they mean. So, for example, uh, so yeah, so like, here's what, here's the definition of a Raman Newton graph. Um, well, I have some graph, I have some n vertex d regular graph with an adjacency matrix A. And then I look at the eigenvalues, they're going to be um, ordered. And then uh, the trivial eigenvalue here is just uh, lambda one, which is going to be equal to D. And uh, the alon Vaplana theorem says that for all the non-trivial eigenvalues, they have to cover this like interval from minus two root D minus one to two root D minus one. And this two square root D minus one is the spectral radius of the infinite D regular tree. So yeah, I really want to think about this statement as a statement about the infinite tree. So it says that for every like finite irregular graph, I, uh, the non-trivial eigenvalues can't be like squished into a smaller uh, interval than the, the uh, spectrum of the infinite irregular tree. And yeah, and what a raman Newton graph is, is just, uh, it's a graph that like exactly matches this lower bound. So it uh, has the, all of the, non-trivial eigenvalues inside the two square root D minus one interval. And yeah, there are like many explicit constructions here. So uh, there's uh, constructions by uh, Margulis and Lubotsky, Philip Sarnan uh, and Morgenstern for uh, when D minus one is a prime power. And then there's the construction by uh, Marcus Wern and Shreve Sala for like bipartite graphs. And um, as uh, there was some discussion earlier, this, this construction can also be made explicit. Uh, right, so I guess, okay, so for, yeah, let me talk about random graphs. Then, well, random graphs are almost Raman Newton in the sense that uh, for every epsilon more than zero, a random D regular graph is like with high probability, all of the trivial, non trivial eigenvalues are inside this like correct Raman Newton interval. And uh, this was like conjectured by Alon and uh, proven by Friedman. And then there was like an alternate proof by Bordenov. And, uh, there was like a recent um, de-randomization of this Freeman's theorem by uh, Mohanty, O'Donnell, and Paradis, which uh, this work also builds on and uses those ideas for uh, the de-randomized version of the Bonner of Collins theorem. Okay, so yeah, I guess uh, if we're going to look at how to generalize Freeman's theorem, then uh, there's like I guess the, the exact notion of the finite graphs that I'm looking for are just, I want to find a sequence of, I want to find a sequence of, like, so given some infinite graph, uh, I guess where in this case, the infinite graph is going to be described by some like matrix polynomial. I want to find a sequence of graphs such that the non-trivial spectrum is epsilon close to the spectrum of the infinite graph in house of distance. And also the infinite graph uh, covers the finite graphs. And yeah, this termino the terminology that I'm using here is uh, calling these things, these finite graphs are called X from a neutron graphs. And uh, this is like from a paper by Mohandi and O'Donnell. And yeah, like as an example uh, that in the Born of Collins paper, it, they, they show that whenever you can take the base, you can choose a base graph H and then uh, the set GN will be like random lifts and then X will be the universal cover of H. So that was the, and this is proven using this uh, polynomials framework. So what Bonnoff and Collins show is that whenever you have a matrix polynomial and uh, uniformly random permutations, then the non-trivial spectrum of the polynomial applied to the finite permutations is going to converge to, in house of, it's going to converge in house of distance to the spectrum of the polynomial applied to the infinite generators, which is like the, the infinite graph. And I guess in the language of uh, free probability, this uh, they show this. This means that the like random permutations are asymptotically strongly free. And I guess just to remind you, the matrix polynomials uh, they they like really encompass like a lot of graphs, including all of these uh, free products and so on. So, 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, what, what we do in our paper is that we make this uh, theorem algorithmic in the sense that uh, if I have a matrix polynomial defining an infinite graph and some um, epsilon more than zero, um, I can have a polynomial time algorithm that produces a graph on uh, order of n vertices such that uh, the, my finite graph is covered by the infinite graph and also the finite graph spectrum is epsilon close and Hausdorff distance to the infinite graph spectrum. Okay, so... Um, Can I yeah. ask a, a question oh. about the random statement, please? Okay. The probability of error sums so that it's a probability one event in the infinite sequence? Um, it, it, does it, is, it, is it a strong convergence in the sense of? It converges in probability, if, if that's what you mean. As in, it, it, the probability goes to one as n goes to infinity. But it goes to one fast enough so that the error, the sum of the errors is finite? The error is one over n squared? Uh, I am not sure. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, or at least I only know for sure that it's like little, or yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, um, right, so, okay, let me talk a little bit about how the de-randomization works. So I guess uh, this, like, um, uh, these, these ideas are kind of from the paper of uh, Mohanty, O'Donnell, and Paradis, and also from this uh, paper of Bilyeu Linnell, uh, where we can uh, construct a pseudo-random, like, permutation to plug into each of these uh, polynomials by uh, first, we construct like a sort of small-ish permutation uh, pseudo randomly, and then to this permutation, we do a series of two lifts in order to get like a n size uh, permutation. And then, uh, so okay, like I guess the key thing to do is just that to say that every time you do this two lift, you preserve like the good like spectral properties of the previous permutation, and then. Uh, th like, so, okay, this is like the strategy in this uh, previous papers, but uh, the key like difference here is just that we need to like prove these uh, norm bounds involving uh, matrix weights and uh, that involves some sort of cover like rearranging the, of, uh, rearranging the sequence of matrices so that like they, they all get bounded properly. And uh, yeah, so let me like go through maybe a few steps in the proof. Uh, so I guess the first thing that uh, we do, the first thing that we need to do, okay, so I guess the, these uh, proof steps are like very similar to the steps in the paper of Bond of Collins. And uh, mostly, yeah, so I'll, I'll make a note of like what we needed to do differently. So the first thing that happens is this uh, linearization step, which kind of says that, well, okay, we wanted to, we want prove this theorem for like every polynomial, but like instead uh, we can do this uh, linearization trick that appears in like some operator algebra uh, literature that says that, oh, you, it, whenever you want this convergence to happen for all polynomials, for all like matrix weighted polynomials, it actually suffices to uh, prove it for linear polynomials with matrix weights. And this is like a thing that really only works because of the matrix weights. It's like whenever you take, so it's like, I take my uh, high degree polynomial and there's like some sort of transformation that I can do that converts the nonlinear polynomial into a linear polynomial, but with different matrix weights. So uh, yeah, if I have, so that's why if I am able to like bound every linear polynomial, then that can be transformed into bounds on every nonlinear polynomial. And then the bounds on every nonlinear polynomial allows me to bound the Hausdorff distance convergence for every nonlinear polynomial by basically by using the spectral mapping theorem. And yeah, so this really, it, like, I guess the, the, the key idea is just that it's like, 
you really at each of these steps need to prove the bounds for every polynomial simultaneously in order for it to work. And yeah, okay, this linearization trick that we end up using is uh, due to PCR. And um, like, okay, I guess the main thing that we needed to do here differently from the Born of Collins paper is that we needed to make all of these arguments like quantitative so that the, the uh, like for the explicit constructions, the um, error terms don't like propagate too much. Um, and then there's another step which says that, okay, there's this matrix value like thing that's similar to the Ihara Bass formula, which like relates the spectrum of the adjacency operator to this thing called the non-backtracking operator, which is kind of like the adjacency operator, but defined on the edges instead of the, the vertices. And uh, yeah, so for, for any, and like the thing here is also saying that uh, for any matrix polynomial, um, P, if I have a bound, if I have a uniform bound on the norm of all non-backtracking tra operators with like bounded weights, I can somehow convert that into a bound on the uh, adjacency operator of the original polynomial. So again, here, like the kind of crux of the argument is that we needed to bound like all of the uh, matrix weighted polynomials at the same time in order for this to work. So I guess this part of the argument, like it appears in the Born of Collins paper and uh, it's also like completely deterministic. So there wasn't much change needed. And uh, like the main key thing now is just that we need to prove norm bounds on this uh, non backtracking operator with matrix weights. And like the thing that, uh, the thing that I guess Born of Collins do and also all of these uh, previous papers is that the thing to do here is to use the trace method. And uh, what that does is like you count the Weights, you, you, you count the weights of uh, like closed walks on the finite graphs. And, uh, but the weights of the closed walk, it's like a product of matrices here. So we need to do some sort of uh, arranging of this product. And what uh, like the trace method is gonna prove is that it proves that for any like big random permutation with this uh, bicycle free property, which is what was used in the, uh, in the de-randomization of Friedman's theorem by the by Mohanty O'Donnell Paradis. And uh, that we use that to show that whenever you do a random two lift, it preserves like good the, the good like norm bounds. And then this can also be de-randomized by using like pseudo-random two lifts instead of just like random two lifts. So yeah, this is uh, again the I guess the trace method uses some like similar ideas to the proof of uh Bonhoff and Collins, but uh, it also is slightly different because like, and it like, so the, this thing about two lifts, it cannot be, it cannot just be like derived in the black box way from like one of Collins. We needed to use some uh, new ideas as well. Okay, so uh, I guess like just to conclude, uh, I was, I think the main, the main like idea here is just uh, that non-commutative polynomials of these are, uh, uh, of these like generators, they are like a, some sort of algebraic recipe for constructing many infinite graphs. And uh, by replacing the generators with finite permutations, I can also find finite graphs that are covered by them. And then I can like explicitly construct the permutations so that like every, uh, so that I can get finite graphs that are spectrally close to the infinite graphs defined by the polynomials. And I guess like a uh, open question that might be interesting here is just like, is there a similar sort of uh, recipe for other kinds of combinatorial objects like uh, simplicial complexes. Um, yeah, I guess that would be that would be cool. Okay. Um, yeah. It's okay. Like, great. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, 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 two questions. Yes, yeah, I, uh, I can see, uh, I mean, I don't see the poor, but I can imagine that when you're talking about bounds, then eventually you can get Ramanujan in the weak, uh, almost Ramanujan in the weaker sense, namely that uh, the spectrum is bounded within the same bound uh, of, the, of the covering tree. But how can you escape from the alls, for example, in the example of bi-regular graph, uh -huh. the, so the, the spectrum is not a continuous uh, interval. I mean, you claim in the theorem that you can avoid also this interval. And yeah. somehow, if the proof is always kind of bounds, how can you escape that? 
Right. So I think that comes in this uh, step in the linearization proof, which um, because like we first have the bounds for every like non-linear polynomial, then you can take essentially you take like your spectrum that has these gaps, and then I apply like a polynomial to the adjacency matrix so that now um, I like transform. I, I basically like fold the spectrum so that there's no more gaps, and then I have like non-bounds on that adjacency matrix because that's now going to be like a high de higher degree like polynomial matrix polynomial. So it, it, it really works because I simultaneously have bound on like every like high degree polynomial. Yeah, it's a vice stress approximation theorem eventually that the polynomials yeah. are from in, in your, you can make a characteristic function of an integral. Uh, I want to know what X is. X so is that, that's the question that, uh, that we were discussing earlier. In each case for which you can prove this, I, I believe the theorem should be true without any assumptions, meaning you go to the universal cover and you ask whether the random guy uh, has in the sense of your Hausdorff Gromov distance in the spectrum will converge. Uh, that's probably true just because it's certainly true that the, uh, if you Gromov, uh, if you Benjamini Schramm converge, then the spectral densities converge. No, 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 but Peter, that's, that's the spectral Hausdorff does not converge. Absolutely not, because it's, you know that, because take a tree, just go to the ordinary tree, and if you take, uh, um, think about covers as finite index sum group. If your finite index sum groups are going to, to go down into the commutator, then you get more and more billion quotient. And the, oh, no, 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 but the random, for the random, for the random. So the theorem's only for the random. Yeah, I mean, but the Benjamini Schramm converges is. Is, the rand, is like the random. No, I'm talking about if you take a random guy, it will be... No, I mean, the Benjamin Schramm just say that locally you look like the cover. So if I take you bigger and bigger, with no. not random, they also... Be, so Benjamin Schramm by itself, just by itself, will not give you house of convergence, only spectral convergence. Okay, I, I'm very happy to argue this bitterly, but let me ask uh, Shin Yu a question, and then I recommend that uh, at some point, three of us will have a Zoom. Uh, I'm very interested in when you what X is and when you can compute the spectrum explicitly. This is a generalization of Keston's theorem. Keston tells you he can compute the spectrum of a tree, a regular tree. And you have a whole set of new graphs for which uh, you will compute the spectrum before. There are two parts to your work. One is the convergence, this gromov hausdorff but first, let's just talk about the cover. What is the spectrum of the cover? A very interesting question that uh, c star algebra people can't compute the spectrum of, um, of a surface group, Cayley graph of a surface group. Uh, it's an integral, but you can't, it's not a, you, you can't write it down algebraically. I'm sure it's not algebraic. So at what point, at some point you're computing the spectrum and you're using the fact that uh, this, that is finite. You know it's a finite union of intervals, don't you? Or do you yes, not even yeah. know? You know um, that. I, I well, think I actually... Were you using some theorem in C-star algebras or... No, some actually, algebra? I don't... Um, I don't, like... Express, I don't do any, like, computation of the... Right. Uh, You're comparing two things, two unknowns, maybe. But I think you do know that the spectrum isn't a Cantor set, right? Yeah, so I think I know that the spectrum is supposed to be a bunch of intervals, and I think that is... You, you, so you never even use that? You know I never it. use that. So I, I actually only say that the... I only say that, like, I have these... I, whatever the spectrum happens to be, I have these finite graphs that, like, look like the spectrum. But, like, I guess I don't actually know what the spectrum is supposed to be. Yeah, but that's related to, but you've set it up in such a way that, uh, as we believe, I think Alex and I, that all your examples have the property that they are what he calls virtually free. Yeah. And in that case, it's known that you can compute these explicitly. There's a, Keston's okay. work, Keston's theorem actually general, Keston's proof actually generalizes exactly to that family. So this if you ask the content of this linearization statement is this the, this content translating the graph to a tree so then uh, so 
so the x will be if we, we stick to Cayley graphs it should be cl clarified that x is virtually free and then it fits into this theorem as i keep on saying of chomsky which is the only case that people can compute i think it'd be nice to clarify what x is that's all i'm saying <laughs> uh, okay so just a second peter and I, uh, alex uh, you are the Ramanujan uh, <laughs> originators and you certainly asked uh, Shinyu lots of questions. I really hope that there are questions from other people. I have a question. Um, the derandomization that you do uh, to the lifts, is it something uh, simple like uh, K-wise independence or expand the random works. Some of them are used in bilinear. Uh, yeah, I think they are all pretty standard. Um, yeah, I think for the, the permutations part, it's just like KY's independence. And uh, yeah, wait, sorry. I don't remember what, what the, the, the two lifts part was supposed to be. I think it's also just like some sort of random bit string that is a uh, uh, like sort of classical construction. Okay. And the uh, analysis you need to do using uh, Fizier or matrix uh, concentration bound. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you need their de-randomized version also. Oh, those are not uh, randomized. So actually for all of these, uh, at least for the linearization part, it's like for any permutations, these work. Okay. So it's like, yeah, yeah. For, for, for already fixed permutation. Okay. More question. Yeah, I've made Another a question. In, um, in your talk, you mostly, I uh, mean, you were focusing on the uh, X Ramanujan, but with an approximate, with an epsilon. Are there some notions of exactly X Ramanujan? And would you conjecture that there always exists some lift or maybe some random lift with probably some probability being exactly X Ramanujan? Um, I guess, uh, like, it's kind of difficult to define because, like, I guess the way that I'm defining it is using, like, Hausdorff distance. And, like, because the, the spectrum of the finite graphs are, like, discrete, they're always going to, there's always going to be, like, some sort of epsilon error going on. Um, but I guess you can, you might, like, ask for something like the, I want the finite graphs so that uh, they are, like, the, the spectrum is like exactly contained in the intervals of the infinite graph. And um, uh, I guess the best I can say that is I don't know, but like it seems maybe believable that you can always get a lift that, you can get a lift where that works, I where that happens. Spearman methods ensure that, no? The method, the Spearman give you something like that. Existence again, not I don't know about constructive. That's yeah, was pretty good at the time, but I now don't remember. No, the trouble with the freed uh, with the Spearman method is it only works with some assumption. Like it can't even get the symmetric. It can't get a Ramanujan graph. It has to. So it can't touch the bottom, as you remember. But uh, I'm sure it's true. Yeah, so it's like a one, that was a one-sided <laughs> bound, right? So, um, like, I mean, I think it's, it's, I'm sure it's true that you can bound the, you can get like an existence proof of like the upper bound of the spectral radius, probably, um, using that method. Um, I am not so sure that you can bound like the every interval. And, but I'm, okay, but I'm sure that it's true that you can find finite graphs that like exactly fit into every interval. <laughs> good, that's a good conjecture. Uh, I have, more, I have more, a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is more practical, or not, not so practical, but I was wondering if you want, want to say a word about like CSP applications, or, or maybe there's applications even to these belief propagation or survey propagation, statistical physics style algorithms? Um, yeah, so I, I guess in the paper, we do talk about some CSP applications. Like, uh, so, uh, at least like this is like kind of why we started thinking about these graphs is like trying to express the constraint graphs of like random constraint satisfaction, random like degree two constraint satisfaction problems. And yeah, it so happens that these are additive products 
can express such constraint graphs and like using this uh, using this uh, using this uh, using the results in our paper we can actually get like bounds on the spectral value of such uh, constraint expression problems and then yeah like in I guess in future work we are looking at like trying to also bound like the SDP value. So you, you have explicit, um, you know, counter examples to or better bounds for uh, integrality gaps in uh, some kinds of CSPs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, more question. All right, uh, it was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah.